Hey babe, and anybody else watching, and welcome back to A Life Together. Today, numbers 12 and 13. Uh, we are coming off of a couple different things, the silver trumpets, uh, we're coming off of the story of the um, departure from Mount Sinai, and then also the quail, uh, the quail that God brought in for the Israelites, and some of their response to it as well. So today, uh, we are looking at Miriam, and that is uh, Moses' sister, and Aaron, her brother, um, grumbling against Moses. And we'll see God's response to that. Uh, we're not going to talk about Moses' response. We'll talk about God's response. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we will also see the exploration and then the report about Canaan. <clears throat> now, this is a land that God has said, hey, I'm giving to my people. Uh, so we're going to see a little bit on that too. So all of this, uh, numbers 12 and 13. So chapter 12. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent of, and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, leprous like snow, and Aaron turned towards her and saw that she had leprosy. And he said to Moses, Please, my Lord, do not hold against us the sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, <clears throat> If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back. After that, the people left Hazaroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. Chapter 13. <clears throat> the Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So, at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. These are their names. From the tribe of Reuben, from the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, son of Zachur. From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Egal, son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gedaliel, son of Sodi. From the tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Joseph, Gadi, son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, son of Gamali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, son of, Mi uh, son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nahabi, son of Vospi, uh, Vop Vopsi. From the tribe of Gad, Guel, son of Maki. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave to Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on to the hill country. See what the land is like, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak or few or many. Well, what kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob, uh, Rehob towards Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev and came to Hebron, where a high man, Shishai, Talmai, and the descendants of Anak lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkel, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place 
was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There, they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and even the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among... Uh, they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great of size. And we saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So two things here, which I think is is really cool. But one of the things that I had noted right off the bat was... God called Miriam, Aaron, and Moses uh, to be in front of him. And he said, essentially, that I have Moses' back. Not only that, I don't speak to him in any riddles or with hidden mysteries. I speak with him face to face. I speak with Moses as I would a friend. It's, I mean, that's what's coming across here. And yet, you didn't have any fear about speaking up against him. And I thought it was so cool that... Moses is known to be so, so incredibly close with God. He is walking so close with God. He's just together with God in every step. And then when people bring a charge against Moses, Moses doesn't defend himself. But God defends Moses. God, I was going to say defends his honor, but, but really he comes to Moses' aid. And I think that's so important for us to recognize that if we are together with God, it doesn't matter what people say about us. If we're together with God, then God will have our backs. And often in ways that we would have never imagined, and very likely in ways we don't even know, that God is working for our protection to his glory. So I thought that was cool. Uh, the other thing here, too, is obviously um, looking at, what is it, uh, chapter 13, verse 30. Uh, this is coming back in the report of the exploration of Canaan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. I mean, I think that without God, his response is a little, is probably a little ridiculous. I mean, people talk about the Nephilim and the descendants of Anak as being giants. Again, I'm not a history buff, but I've I've heard that. And if that's, if that's the case, if these, uh, the sons of the Nephilim or the Nephilim are these giants, these just massive people... And they have giant stores of food and huge walls around their cities. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of reason for that hope. But as we'll see later on, he's a very faithful man. And so he knows that they're not going alone. They're going together with God. We should go along because I think we can do it. He doesn't say that. He says we should go because we can certainly do it. That's awesome. So he recognizes that they're going with God. They can certainly do it, and they would have and will, but we'll take a look at that as we move on. But that's very, very important to know. So let's pray about it. God, thank you that we can have confidence, Lord. We can have full confidence in you because of what your word says about your son. We know that when people are coming against us, God, when we hope in you, that is the surest hope we have, that you will defend us from the unknown, from grumbling enemies or even from grumbling brothers and sisters. Lord, help us to recognize that you are the one that protects us. The closer we are to you, um, the better that is for us, Lord. Help us to recognize also that we can do whatever you would have us do when you are uh, at our back, Lord. When you are the one protecting us, there's nothing that can't be done. I would just ask that you help us remember that and help us to have no lack 
of faith, Lord, but that we would have just so much faith that all of that can come to pass because it is not our doing to drive out those armies, God, but it is you and it is your doing and that all of it has already been completed because of your son. And we thank you so, so much for his work on the cross. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. As always, thanks so much for joining and uh, know that I appreciate you. Wife, appreciate you tons. And I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.